He's given him a name above every name. That's exactly right. That's good. That's beautiful. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning, please. Book of Genesis, Exodus, rather, chapter number 3 and verse number 15. Exodus 3, 15. We'll start reading with verse number 11, get the context. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token to thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said to God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me to you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me to you. This is my name forever. Now watch this. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Father, I pray that you bless your holy word as it goes forth, Father, from this messenger. I pray that you'd anoint me to preach it this morning and open the hearts of the people to receive it. In thy holy name, amen. Now tomorrow is a very solemn day. Tomorrow is a day that we set aside and call it Memorial Day. I don't know if you've ever been to some of these cemeteries we have here in the Knoxville area, but we have many war dead that are buried around here in this area. Memorial Day started right after the Civil War. 1866, as a matter of fact, you can date it back to that time. The Battle of Shiloh was the first great major battle that was fought in the Civil War where thousands upon thousands upon thousands died. The American Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the War with Mexico. A lot of people died in those three wars. But the war, the Battle of Shiloh, had more dead than all three of those wars combined. At the end of this four years of struggle, over 600,000 Americans had died. Now take that and compare it to the population at that time, to the population of America today, and you're talking about a whole lot of people. Amen. What had happened to the nation is that it was literally shocked at the carnage and the death and the bloodshed that had taken place over that four-year period of time. And so they, com they felt compelled to do something about it. And so they started a memorial, or they called it then Decoration Day. When they would remember the dead, so many, so, so many that had died in this country, over 600,000, the North and the South, both set aside times when they would recognize on an annual basis the dead that had given their life for their country. And so Memorial Day, as we know it today, came into being. And as I said to you at the beginning of the message this morning, Memorial Day is a good day. Don't ever forget those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, who shed their blood. And, their, and, and, and you need to remember that freedom is not free. I know you've heard that, but it's true. It is not free. And the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. We are being assaulted now by so-called ISIS, these Muslim murderers, and by other factions here and there that are trying to take away from our nation the freedom that we have. And we are going to have to fight. It's going to take a real battle. It's going to take rooting them out and destroying them from the face of the earth. You say, that's not very Christian, preacher. If you'll ever study the Bible with me, 
You'll find out in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord said, if they smite you on one cheek, turn the other. That's what you should do in the Sermon on the Mount. But then before he ascended to heaven, he said to his disciples, if you've got a cloak, sell it and buy a sword. Yeah, yeah. The reason they were to buy a sword is because they were facing now a hostile world, hostile to their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith in Christ has never been, has never nor will it ever be, a kind of faith that the world loves. When the Lord Jesus was here, he said, I came to put man against man, brother against brother. He said, my faith and who I am and what I preach and what I'm about is going to separate people. And the ones that it draws together are those who have true faith in our Lord Jesus. As brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of our, regardless of our race, regardless of our, of our geographical location, regardless of whether we're Americans or Frenchmen or Italians or whatever, it is Christ that brings us together. Amen. That is what we are about in this house. We're about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And it should be about him. Here in the book of Exodus, he said to Moses, when he said, what is your name? What am I going to tell them? In Hebrew, it says, Ahaya, Ahaya. That literally means I am that I am. I exist because I exist. Yes. He is the everlasting, ever existing one. In other words, I am, if you're hungry, I can feed you. I am, if you need a savior, I can save you. I am, if you need protection, I can protect you. I am everything that you ever thought you needed and far above what you know. I am all things. I am that I am. In other words, Israel, you need a deliverer. I am that deliverer. You need one to judge your gods there that have kept you in bondage. I am the one that can do that. I am that I am. And boy, when God said that, the Lord Jesus Christ quoted that scripture in John chapter number 8. And he said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. In other words, I identify with that one that spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter number 3. Everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. The almighty El Shaddai, the eternal one. No, my dear friend, he is inexhaustible in his supply. My friend, far above and beyond all that you could ask or think he's able to do. I am that I am. We've made God in our image instead of letting God make us in his image. We brought him down to us instead of letting him take us up to him. He's greater than we are. He's higher than we are. He's everything that my soul ever needed or ever will need. He's the satisfier of my very heart. The Lord Jesus Christ is the great I am. Hey, I am that I am. Boy, what a thing to say to Israel. The ancient people they're called from generation to generation. They've had their enemies. To this very day, Israel and the Jews get blamed for everything on this earth. I get so sick of hearing that garbage. All you got to do is do a little study and read. And you'll find out, my dear friend, the one to blame here, my friend, is that one that has rebelled against God, not the Jew. Jew or Gentile, bond or free, it makes no difference. We're all under the bondage of sin. And there's only one. One that can make you free. I am can do that. And so he said, I want you to hand this down as a memorial. Pass it from generation to generation. Teach your children. Instruct them in the law of the Lord. Teach them about the one that brought them out of Egypt. Tell them who I am. And I'll tell you, my friend, we need to do that for our kids today. We need to tell, we need to tell them, teach them, preach to them, instruct them, guide them, lead them, do whatever needs to be done to instruct them in the way of the Lord because the world will pervert their mind and distort the truth and lead them astray. So the first time the word memorial shows up in the Bible, the first time the word memorial shows up in Scripture, it has to do with his name. And that's the most important thing about God. My friend, he can heal. He can save. He can deliver. He is that he is. But the most important thing you'll ever know about God is to know his name. What is his name, preacher? Jesus. That's his name. Amen. In the book of Exodus chapter number 12 and verse 11, here's another memorial that's given to you in Scripture. In Exodus chapter number 12 and verse 11, And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. 
It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am <laughs> the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Amen. This passing over, this judgment of God, this wrath coming upon their gods. God takes great delight in destroying the gods of this world. Amen. He takes great delight in confrontation between the God of this world and the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. He will not run from a fight. When it comes God Almighty facing Satan, he will face him off every time. And he has faced him off at the cross at Calvary. The bulls of Bashan gathered around him to destroy Christ, and they could not do it. Amen. Even when God the Father turned on his Son, and the heavens were black, the Son of God said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so it was at the cross at Calvary. Here he comes into Egypt, and he judges the gods of Egypt, and he passes over them. Let me ask you a question. Has he passed over you? Has he passed over you? Or are you under the judgment of God? Is the wrath of God waiting for the day that he will pour it out upon your soul? We live in a carefree, cavalier, laid-back culture. Anything goes today. I have never in my lifetime seen the wickedness that's in your face now. In your face they want you to see it. They're proud of it. They parade it in front of you. And the Bible tells me plainly in Romans chapter number 1, for this cause God gave them over to a reprobate mind. I'm not their judge. I'm just a man like you. I'm the judge of no man. But I'll tell you this. When the Passover took place, it was the Passover of the grace of God carrying those inside that house and putting a hand up and saying, you can't cross this bar. You can't enter into this house. You can't judge these people. They're mine. And I'm glad, thank God, that his banner over me is love and the blood has covered my soul. The blood has washed my sins away. The blood has given me a covenant between me and God. Satan cannot cross the blood. Amen. He can't do it. Hallelujah to God. Has he passed over you? If he ever passes over you, he'll not come back to pass again. Once you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of God till the day of redemption, nobody can break that seal. I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them from my hand. I'm glad that if I lose my mind, it's not going to change my salvation. I'm glad that I am kept by the power of God until the day of redemption. So, well, preacher, it's up to me to live right and keep myself saved. Ah, so then you saved yourself to begin with. For you really don't understand what grace is all about. When God saved you, he came into the very hell hole you were in. When he saved you, he found you as you were. When he saved you, he came to what you were. When he saved you, he didn't call you out of it. He didn't set something up and say, come here and I'll meet with you. He came where you were. Amen. Hallelujah to God. That's grace. Grace, grace, grace. He saved me in my sin. Then he saved me from my sin. Then he gave me the grace of God to overcome my sin. Just as I am without one plea. Come down to this altar with all of your filth and your stinking dirty self. Come down to this altar with everything you've ever done and what you are. And you'll find grace and mercy and cleansing in the blood of Christ. And you'll get up and walk away from this altar new and cleansed and saved and born again. And you'll leave all that hell right here because he paid for it on the cross. I will pass over you. That's a memorial, young people. Well, preacher, I just don't see it that way. I just don't think people are that bad. Then leave your door open tonight. I marvel at these progressive liberals when they talk about building a wall and they don't believe in building a wall, they don't believe in this, don't believe in that, but they hire bodyguards. 
and they live in gated communities. Biggest hypocrites that ever lived on the face of the earth. You better lock your door, boys, and put a, put a deadbolt on there. Amen. Get you a 357, take it out to the range and learn how to hold them and squeeze them and get sight alignment and learn how to breathe. You better learn how to fire a weapon because you live in a godless generation in a society. Amen. 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 The, the Kelly, General Kelly, uh, Marine, well, Marine General, wasn't he? Three or four star general said the other day, he's the, what is the Homeland Security, whatever he is. He said, if you knew what I know, that's what he said now. He said this publicly. I don't know that he cleared it through all the channels. But he said, if you knew what I know, you'd never walk out of your house. Now we're talking about a general officer. We're not talking about somebody on Hay Boy Corner. That's what he said. And I've noticed all the police officers I've ever known down through the years. And I love our police officers and appreciate them and respect them. I wouldn't want their job, folks. If you have any idea what a hard job is, you imagine what a police officer has. But here's what. I have never seen a police officer off duty that wasn't armed. <laughs> They're armed to the teeth. You know why? Because I've had them tell me. Police officers, former police officers, I've had them tell me. I've gone out and I've shot with them and we've cop chopped wood together and all. I've had them tell me time and time again, preacher, there's a lot of stuff out there. If you only knew what was out there. So I'm trying to tell you tonight, you better have a banner over you and you better get some sense about you. Amen. The Passover. In the book of Leviticus chapter number 23 and verse 39. Leviticus 23 verse 39. The scripture says also on the 15th day of the seventh month when you have gathered in the fruit of the land. Well, keep the feast of the Lord seven days. The first day shall be a Sabbath. On the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days and keep the feast unto the Lord. It shall be a statue, verse 41, forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. What is this, preacher? This is the Feast of Tabernacles. What does that mean? What would anybody want to get into a booth? And why would they want to build something like that and get them put themselves into it? What could that possibly do for anyone, preacher? It's a reminder, the Lord said, of where you came from. I'm reminding you that ye dwelt in the land of Egypt as slaves. You, want, you at one time were slaves to Pharaoh. Amen. One time you had no freedom. It was taken from you. And the hand of the Lord, the long outstretched arm of God pulled you out of it. Amen. And they brought you out and they said, I want you to build a booth. And I want you to remember that your world is my world. And where I put you, I keep you. And your memory don't ever forget where you came from. Amen. I've heard an awful lot of preachers that will lead you to believe that they were saints when they were born. And the day that they came into the world, a little halo was around their head. You could never get them to confess that they really did anything wrong. Well, let me tell you something. I'm a dirty, low-down, junkyard dog. Amen. I give God the glory for everything that I am today. Why else would I be standing before you preaching because I'm good enough? No, because of where he brought me from. I made every mistake you can make. Did everything you could do. Went every way in rebellion against God till he reached down in 1973 and called me by his grace and saved my soul. The proud, arrogant Pharisee doesn't like to hear that. They don't like that. For some reason, they want to parade their righteousness in front of you. I got news for you. I got news for you. When it comes to the issue of righteousness, you turn me off. Amen. Our righteousness is as a filthy rag. Amen. The only righteousness that matters before God is the righteousness of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you cannot live right to get that righteousness. You couldn't even sacrifice your body and get that righteousness. You can't be good enough to get the righteousness of the Son of God. Then how, preacher, 
Christ is made unto me righteousness. When I put my faith and trust in him and say, Lord Jesus, I am no good. You're the only goodness that's ever been about me. He becomes your righteousness by faith. And so it's all about my Lord Jesus and not about me. You say then, preacher, is that a, is that a, is that a, is that a, are you telling us that it's okay to sin then? No, not at all. Once you ever understand the grace of God and the righteousness of the Son of God, then you'll get on your knees and you'll say, Lord, you've been so good to me. I don't deserve what you've done. You've been good to me. Lord, you've been so good to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can never live up to what God demands and the standard that he's laid out for us through his holy law. I'll always fail and come short. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the grace of God. Amen, amen, amen. Then the Bible says in the book of Joshua, chapter number 4 and verse 12. Joshua chapter 4 and verse 12. Here's another memorial in the Bible. Joshua 4, 12. And the Joshua chapter number 4. Verse, verse 7. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Joshua 4, 7. Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. When Joshua and the children of Israel crossed the, Red, the Jordan River, the Bible said the waters had stopped flowing up at the city of Adam. That's strange. And the water began to build up at Adam. But they walked across. The moment their foot touched the, touched the water, it stopped flowing. The priest put his foot down. In other words, in an act of faith, he went through with what God told him to do. That act of faith opened doors for them. The moment he put his foot down on that water, it stopped flowing all the way to the north in the city of Adam. And the water began to build up there at Adam. And they went into the middle of the... Jordan River and they took 12 stones out of that mud and they carried those 12 stones and they brought them out and they piled them up and they remained there as a memorial as to what God had done by bringing the children of Israel across and they picked up 12 other stones and put them in the center of the river. These 12 stones were brought out of the place where they were buried by death because the Jordan River is the river of death. It's the descender. When the Lord Jesus was baptized, he went into the river of death and he came out alive, showing he had power over death. When the soul is baptized by John the Baptist, they were put under the river of death and they were brought back up living because they had died to death and death had no more power over them. And they were raised up from the dead. So these 12 stones are piled up as a memorial, as a witness that they had been brought out of death. This is what's important for you to understand today. Just as I said at the beginning of the message, when God saved you, he came to where you were. Amen. He found you where he found you. Ask you a question. Don't answer it publicly. Where did he find you? What kind of shape were you in when God found you? What kind of sin were you practicing? What kind of lifestyle were you living? Whatever it was, that's where he found you. But he didn't leave you there. He picked you up. He carried you away from death. And he put you in the land of the living. Not only did he put you in the land of the living, but stones that were dead have now become lively stones. Living stones. In plain words, he brought you out of the river of death and he put you into the wall that he's building. A wall where you're cut out of the ground. You're cut out in your fashion. Before you're ever put in that wall, the workman worked at the site where he cut the stone. Not a sound was heard where they built the temple. Not a sound. All of the work was done before being put in the wall, that took some engineering. That took some intelligence to make that stone fit 
When President Trump went to the Wailing Wall and bent over and put his hand on that wall, he's the first sitting president of the United States to ever do that. But I noticed there the, the video, the cameras got close-ups and you could see where he put his hand. And these huge stones are called ashlars, ashlar. That's what the archaeologists call them, an ashlar. And if you look carefully, you can see the stone. Then you can see there's an area cut around it all the way. These stones were cut and placed into that wall, no mortar. They've been there for 2,000 years. Strong, interlocked, building. It's not going anywhere. There's a stone down underneath the ground. It's one of the largest stones that men have ever seen. Hand hewn by men. They say it weighs over 50 tons. Over 100,000 pounds. Huge stone. Cut and fit exactly in place. Cut you exactly when he cut you out of the ground. When he brought you out of the Jordan. He knew exactly where he was going to put you in the wall. And when he cut me out. And he cut me and he fashioned me and formed me. He turned around and he brought me. And he set me in that wall. Amen. I've been set in that wall as a lively stone. Amen. In other words, as an inexplicable life. As a, as a life that cannot be explained by humanity in human terms. And yet I'm alive. Amen. My life did not come from the stone. My life came from the one who cut me and put me in the wall. Amen. But he didn't leave me shining as a stone. Then he covered me with wood. And the wood is the humanity of Christ. Now he's beginning to cover me up so he can walk with me. Because the holy God cannot look upon sin. And you wonder sometimes, how in the world can God show up in a church when we know we're all sinners? How can he do it? Has he violated his holiness? No. It's the way he does his graciousness. Because when he puts the wood, he doesn't stop there. Then he puts gold. And that gold represents the deity of Christ. It represents his perfection. And so when the Holy One says that the church of God is the habitation of God through the Spirit, it means that he can walk down these aisles, walk up to you hand in hand, have fellowship with you, not because he sees you, but he sees Christ. Because my life is hid with God in Christ. As long as I think that's true, and as long as I believe that's true, it is true. For by faith that becomes true. But if you stand in here and you rear back and you smile and you have all of your accolades and everything that men have pinned upon you, I mean, some folks are real high in their religion. Believe me, they are it. And they think that they're gracing you with their presence. and They're holier than thou. You can be certain of this. They're twice dead and plucked up by the roots. For they have no idea what the Holy One is like when he comes by. But that sinner that comes into this house and smites his chest and says, God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful. You don't. You say to yourself, I don't deserve to be in here. You say to yourself, I'm not good enough to come before God. Well, we're not. Never have been, never will be, except by one greater than us. But you come with that attitude. You come with that attitude before the Lord, and you'll find him cut you, put you in the wall, put his wood over you, cover you with a deity, and then you'll feel his presence as he goes by. That's fellowship, and some of you felt that. You came in here dragged down, defeated and destroyed, but then something happened in your soul when you came into the house of God. You started hearing from one who was bigger than you and greater than you. Grace began to flood your heart, and a word came into you that said, I love you, I love you, I love you. And when you heard that for the first time in your life, you began to shout inside. You said to yourself, how in the world can he love me? Because he, how could he love me? Does he really understand who I am and what I've done? He loves you in spite of it. Amen. And then when you come and you get on your knees and you cry out to God and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Forgive me. Cleanse me. You'll find that burden lift. You'll find joy flood your soul. You'll find the power of God move in your heart. You'll find yourself a changed person. Then you'll know what fellowship with God is all about because that's what he wants. That's what he made man for in the first place. Nowhere in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation does it say one time that he ever fellowshiped with anything but a man. 
man's the only creature that God fellowships with. I want you to look at Exodus chapter 16. I'll hurry along here, but I want you to see this. Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 31. And the house of Israel called the name of the called the name thereof manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, fill an omer of it, be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And so they did. And they filled it. And they put it in there. And it was put in this pot. And it was kept in there for generation after generation after generation. You say, what's the big deal about that? Did you know that on the sixth day, on the sixth day, that if they went out and they tried to gather up too much manna, what would happen to it? It would rot. And the Bible said the worms would eat it. It would rot. And so the same manna that could be taken and put in a pot and kept for generation after generation after generation, that same manna would rot if it was used for, used for the wrong reason. There's a lesson in here. There's a great lesson in here. The Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. And He's your Savior now. He's not your Savior on down the road when you decide, well, I'm going to enjoy my life and I'm going to take pleasure in my sin. And then when I get old and feeble and can't sin anymore, then I'm going to get saved. You're not going to get anything. It doesn't work that way. Let me tell you when you're going to get saved. You're going to get saved when the Holy Ghost moves upon your soul. And the Holy Ghost brings you in conviction to Christ. And the Holy Spirit is present to convict you and draw you to the Son of God. And you hear Him and you hear that manna and that manna is sweet and that manna is alive and that manna will save your soul. For Christ is that manna, John chapter number 6. But if you decide that you're going to be manipulating and you're going to control the manna and you're going to put your hand upon it, it's going to rot and draw worms. That's what's happened an awful lot of people in their churches. Their religion's full of worms. <laughs> they got a wormy religion. Right wormy, if you please, and not born again. Now, I'm going to close with this one. Would you turn with me in the book of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 6. Matthew 26, 6. Matthew 26, 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came a woman to him having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And then the Lord said, Why trouble you the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. They did not understand spiritual truths. And that will make you, that will destroy your fellowship with God to not understand spiritual truths. A lot of people get elder brother syndrome. You know what the elder brother syndrome is? I've been in church 30 years. I've been living for God all my life. I've been in the way had a woman tell me that one time, I've been in this way for 40 years. I said, yeah, you're in the way already. <laughs> I didn't say it to her. I was more kind than that. But you need to know the circumstances surrounding what was going on. But anyway, that's what I said. Lord, help me. Sometimes I say things I shouldn't say. But <laughs> that did go through my mind. Yeah, you're in the way. <laughs> but anyway, we got a lot of people in the church who want to look down their nose at people. You know, they get this sanctimonious, holier-than-thou attitude. And you forgot where you came from. You forgot where you came from. Forgotten that you've been purged from your old sins. And you've forgotten who keeps you. And you've forgotten all about it. And you got all your robes on. you got all your religious paraphernalia. And everybody looks good, smells good, talks good. You know, it's amazing when you just watch the way they, they just do before each other. I'd like to know how the real you... <laughs> is during the week <laughs> but here's a woman that didn't care she didn't care she didn't care what anybody thought she didn't care how much it was worth she wanted to do something for the Lord because he meant everything to her and she anointed him and the disciples were indignant 
Why did she anoint him, preacher? She anointed him because she knew he was of the Holy Ghost and what he was doing was of the Holy Ghost and without the Holy Ghost it was all dead anyway. The oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. That's where we get our life. The Holy Ghost of God. Now, this anointing is important. He was anointed three times by human beings on this earth. He was anointed in the house of Simon the Pharisee. He was anointed in the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And then he was anointed in the house of Simon the leper. Three times. But he was also anointed of God the Father at the Jordan River. And God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Lord Jesus Christ is everything or he's nothing. There's only one that the Holy Spirit has poured himself out on completely. That's the Lord Jesus. There's none apart from him. He's everything. He's it. If you want the power of the Holy Ghost, then pray to God that the Lord Jesus becomes the real Lord of your life. And you feed on him day in and day out. Amen. That he's what you live for and he's what you live about. Right. Listen to this little nugget that I read the other day online. Do you remember Notovich, the Russian, the unknown life of Jesus Christ? Do you remember him? I was telling you about him the other day. The one who said that when Jesus, between the age of 12 and 30, that 18-year period of time, he went off to Nepal, he went to Tibet, he went to India, he went off to the east, sat under gurus, and you know all of this garbage about the about the enlightenment and and the higher consciousness and all that junk. And then when he came back, everything that he did in the Holy Land, he was doing it by the power that was vested in him from these swamis and these gurus and these lamas and all of this stuff. And of course, what they've done is diminish Christ. They've brought him down. Instead of being the second person of the Trinity and doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, "Everything I do, I do by the power of the Holy Spirit." Instead of that. They want to bring him down. Listen to this testimony, if you would. This is a great and very informative book, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ. This man says, This is a great and very informative book for anyone who is looking for a more in-depth relationship with Jesus Christ. This book is written from a Russian aristocrat long ago. Though the book is newly published, you can tell it's written in the 1800s, but not so much that it's hard to follow. Now listen carefully. This book is about a man's journey in India to find the secret Hindu beliefs and sites. I am Christian, practicing Hindu, and this book is a great way to help tie both practices together. It's extremely easy to follow along, and though a shorter book, it's full of so much knowledge. Now digest that for a moment. Think on it. This man thinks he's a Christian. He thinks he's a Christian, yet he's a practicing Hindu. He's merged Christ with his millions of Hindu gods. He, no doubt, takes great pride since he has a Hindu background in the fact that Jesus supposedly went to the Hindus, to the Brahmins, to the, to the Lamas, to the Swamis, and he was taught how to do what he was doing. Here's the thing about this. Here's my point. America is full of people just like this. The churches in this country don't preach Christ and him crucified. The only way, the only name under heaven whereby we must be saved, the power of the Holy Ghost of God to change your life. They don't preach that. They're not going to preach that. Why, preacher? Because they don't know him. The Antichrist is just about ready to come on the scene. His message is already being preached. His spirit has already been accepted. The church has already turned away from the gospel. They've turned to him. All they're waiting for, the whole world, everybody right now, they're waiting for the man to show up. Amen. And when he shows up, he'll have a ready audience. 
God help you. God spare you from that. Take what I preached to you this morning. I preached the truth to you. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name under heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm trying to tell you today that I am sinner that's saved by the grace of God that God changed and gives grace to every day of my life. I'm trying to tell you that if you ever go through those gates into glory, it'll be by the Son of God. And the only way you'll ever have the Son of God in your heart is by the grace of God. When you humble yourself, get down on your knees and are willing to receive him into your life, into your life and into your soul and into your spirit as your Savior. I ask you today, will you do that? Will you do that? That is the memorial we should never forget. Father, in thy name we pray. I pray you'd bless your word now as it goes out. The messenger's finished, Father. The messenger has done what you've called him to do. Now, Lord, let them take their attention off of me. I'm nothing. Let them put their attention on thee. Let them focus our Heavenly Father on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that I preach today. Let them think about him, for he can do something for their sins. He can help them, save them, deliver them. In thy holy name I pray, and for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.